So tonight we'll be discussing our minds, which means that we will be thinking about our thoughts. We'll look at how the enemy attacks our minds, and we'll look at the great victory that is available to us in Christ. And my prayer for us here for tonight, as, as it is for this entire week, is that our enemy experiences um, many defeats because of the time that we spend together, and that all of us get to experience many of the victories that are possible to us because of Jesus and because of the power of the gospel. Um, some quick housekeeping. You have uh, the handout. That handout is primarily for your future reference. We will look at it briefly in a couple of places tonight, but it's mostly just for you to take home and hopefully be able to use some of what we discuss just to implement it very practically in your life moving forward. Of course, the full written version of this, any slides or anything like that you might want, you can ask for by email. We'll be glad to get that to you. So here are some foundational thoughts for us. And guys, I'm trying the clicker. It's not working. Now it is. Now both of ours are apparently working. All right, so some foundational thoughts for us here. God has created our mind to use its power and to use its resources to worship and to interpret. To worship and to interpret. That's why God created our minds. That's the purpose for our minds. So meanwhile, Satan then attacks our minds by presenting alternative objects of worship and alternative interpretations. He also attacks our minds by disorienting and misdirecting, distracting our mindset, what our mind is set on. And he attacks our minds by facilitating non-spirit-filled thoughts. Any thought that is not surrendered to the Spirit and take, taken captive to Jesus Christ. And then the promise of Scripture, and especially 2 Peter 1, is that God has given us everything we need to resist these attacks and to defeat Satan by setting our minds on him. Now, the word mind in English and in the biblical languages, it's a very diverse word. It's very rich. Um, as you know, we can use it as a noun. We use it as verb. We use it as kind of an adjective descriptor type of word. So we, think, we say things like, uh, mind your manners and mind your own business. I have a mind to leave. Um, I'll give him a piece of my mind. I've made up my mind. I changed my mind. Keep this in mind. Be mindful. Guard your mind. Expand your mind. Be open-minded. Right? Things can be mind-bending or mind-numbing or mind-blowing. You can take a load off your mind. You can have a lot on your mind. We can speak our mind. We can have a one-track mind. Our mind can go blank. Uh, things can slip our mind. We can be told to Never mind. But if we were to attempt a definition of the word mind, especially as it's translated from the Greek and Hebrew in Scripture, it would be knowledge. It would be a lot of things. It would be knowledge, view, wisdom, insight, even our soul, even our psyche. The word goes that far in describing who we are as human beings in general and as individuals in particular. And of course, our mind is what we think with. It's how we go about thinking. It's essentially our brain plus our heart. Our mind is what generates our beliefs and our thoughts and our emotions and feelings. Romans 12, 1 and 2 say, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And then Mark 12, 28. One of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he, Jesus, answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And then lastly here, 2 Peter 1.3, His divine power has granted to us 
all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. So scripture would tell us that the gospel brings a a comprehensive, holistic salvation. And that salvation includes the salvation of our minds. So the condition and the practice and experience of the saved Christian mind is one of deliverance and and freedom and transformation, worship and love, and from Romans 12 to renewal. That is the condition and the practice of the saved Christian mind. Now, Scripture is full of admonitions and descriptions of how we are to use our mind as Christians, what our mindset is to be as we face daily life, Uh, not just when we're at church on a Sunday, not just at certain times and in certain places, but every moment of every day, what our mindset is to be. And so, of course, there is an enemy that has an entirely different agenda for our minds, whether we're saved or not. His work, the very purpose of his existence is to undermine the work of God in our lives and to undermine God's thoughts in our minds. So we will go to the handout here briefly. We'll look at a few of the passages from the handout. You'll notice that there's the passage plus a summary statement about the passage in light of our, a summary statement about our minds in light of the passage. The summary statements are written as present indicatives, meaning they are a statement of current fact. We do that in order to emphasize that our salvation includes this spirit-filled state of mind as a current reality of who we are in Christ. It's kind of like um, an ER doctor, right? So here's a a med student. She gets her bachelor's degree. She goes to med school. uh, She does her residency. She does her boards. Um, and eventually she is licensed to practice medicine. Her status, her condition, is that of a physician. But then when she pulls a 12-hour shift in the emergency room, now it's her practice of medicine that she is engaged in. The state of a Christian whose mind is surrendered to the Spirit is one of condition and practice, status and behavior. Now, um, if you go to Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. Matthew twenty two thirty seven. The Lord Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. So the summary statement here is that we love God with all our minds. And we express that love. We think through, we meditate on that love at all times. We have God's word in our heart. It's been said that love is the outward expression of faith. Well, as far as our minds and thoughts are concerned, love is an inward expression of faith. Isaiah 26, 3 says, You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. So our mind is stayed on God, and the Hebrew word for stay is samak, and it means to lay, to lean, to rest. It's also the word that was used for the laying on of hands when the priest would lay his hands on the animal sacrifice. And so our mind rests on God, and this can't mean anything except that we think thoughts about God regularly and faithfully. And beyond that, we think thoughts of resting and trusting in Him. Lastly, in this section, Romans 7, 21 through 25, again, we're looking at scriptures that address the condition and the practice of the Christian mind. Paul speaking here. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. And our summary statement here is, the law of our renewed mind fights against our fleshly desires and interpretations and against misguided worship and ways, which means we don't just think about whatever pops into our minds. We have been delivered 
And so we wage the war, this war to think thoughts of truth and worship and love and gratitude. That was not the last one. We have one more, Philippians 4. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So our minds are guarded by the peace of God through Christ, and we think about things that are true and lovely and so forth. Now, the human mind is a powerful thing. Uh, just think about the basic work that your mind does on a minute-by-minute basis. It generates all kinds of thoughts and ideas and concepts. And your mind can get outside of itself and think creatively and imaginatively about itself, like you're doing right now. Now, many have tried to describe uh, the power of our minds in terms of uh, computing power and processing speed and other technical terms. Uh, but in the end, these comparisons fall short. Uh, the mind is truly unique in its abilities. It's beyond comparison to a machine or to anything else. Uh, by way of brief testimony, I'll say that uh, God, in his kindness and grace, alerted me to the war of the mind um, in a way that I was unable or unwilling to understand previously. Uh, the enemy attacked the weakness of my mind, and my mind let me down. Um, is anything about us that we rely on our own strength, uh, that'll happen. Um, in the fall of 2020, uh, in and around a COVID event, I experienced a, an emotional and mental uh, breakdown and it included all the usual physiological issues that come along with mental health struggles. But as I've attempted to go forward now for these last four years, and as I, as I look back and consider that time and, and the time since, I can see how in so many ways my struggles were set up by a lack of resisting the attacks of Satan on my mind. Uh, set up by the cumulative effect of, of years and years of untruthful thoughts and attitudes about God and about myself and about others. Years of thinking without having surrendered my thoughts, without having surrendered my mind and taken every thought captive to Christ. I'm a believer since age 10. I've done all the Christian things, uh, church and Bible reading and prayer and um, ministry and service, even pastoring. But my mind was just on its own kind of freestyle thought journey. And it was just this amalgamation of, of pride and judgmentalism and condemnation and self-absorption and self-obsession and, and despair, um, along with catastrophizing and obsessing and everything else that characterizes a mind that is not every minute of every single day surrendered to the Spirit of God mind that is not set on Christ. Um, so I'm diagnosed and prescribed for major depressive disorder. Uh, during the acute stage, back in late 2020, there was visits to the ER and um, acute anxiety and panic disorder. Um, October 2020 through roughly the same time the following year was just, I would just describe it as, as a hellish nightmare. Um, I was living through what was something of, I guess the apex of the enemy's attacks on my mind and and the aftermath continues every day and you know that's my that's my personal experience but regardless of what each of our particular experiences with our own minds might be all of us as believers can engage the enemy's attack with nothing less than the resurrection power of the spirit that raised jesus from the dead nothing less than the power of the word of god the word from the same voice that spoke the galaxies into existence and breathed breath into the dust that was the human mind and made it alive and able to see and understand and worship its creator. The word made flesh and divinely preserved 
inspired and preserved in the Holy Scriptures. It is that eternal Word. It is that Holy Spirit and His presence that is the infinite will from which our mind is to draw its life and sustenance and comfort and peace and faith and victory over the enemy's attack. So there's a lot going on in our mind. Here's a list of some things. Of course, our beliefs are there. We could define those as our faith decisions about what is true. Also included in our mind is our understanding, which is these are the beliefs through which we process life. And this is the common Old Testament word that you see translated mind in our English translations. Over a hundred times the word understanding is used in the Old Testament. Our minds and thoughts, of course, include our meditations. And these are thoughts and ideas that we dwell on repeatedly or for extended periods of time. It also includes our focus. And these are the thoughts that have the most frequency, the most priority, the most impact in our minds and hearts and in our lives. It also includes our disposition. This is what everybody sees. It's our attitude. Our attitude flows from our state of mind, our disposition. And incredibly, we'll talk about this a little bit more in just a few minutes. Our mind includes our prayers, which are thoughts communicated to God himself. So all that's going on in there. Now, to the full extent of his power, then, Satan has built this entire world to influence and to bring about minds and hearts that are not set on God, that are not surrendered to Satan's enemies, God, the truth, and the gospel. Now, the last part of that sentence is a little bit awkward. Um, what we're trying to recognize here is that it's not that Satan needs minds and hearts that are surrendered directly and explicitly to him. He just needs minds that are conformed to the thinking of this world in whatever non-spirit-led permutation that might be. That's all he needs. He just needs minds that are set on anything but Jesus, surrender to anything but God the Holy Spirit. Reminds me of an old country song that says, I want a ticket that'll take me anywhere but here. And Satan has an endless supply of tickets for our minds to just go all kinds of different places except for where they should be. Any thoughts except the renewed, transformed thoughts of the saved mind, as is described in Scripture. Now, Satan doesn't own creation, and he doesn't create anything. But what he does, and he does this very, very well, is to distort and misinterpret and disorient the good things of God's creation into idols and perversions and obsessions and fears and anxieties and sin. This is his constant attack on everything, so it's definitely his constant attack on our minds. So, we should recognize here tonight that any thought, any mindset or attitude or thought pattern that does not reflect what these scriptures teach us about our minds is an attack of the enemy. It's not another idea. It's not an alternative philosophy. It is an attack of the enemy. So since it's an attack, it's a fight, we as believers have some options here. Um, we can not fight and lose. Pastor Dwayne mentioned this Sunday. If there's a fight but only one person attacks and there's no counterattack or resistance or defense, well, the attacker is sure to win then. We can fight alone and lose very familiar with that. Or we can fight with him and win. There's two motivations for fighting, resisting the attacks of Satan. One is you believe the battle is happening. That's essential. And you believe the fight is worthwhile. Now, I don't like to fight, all right? I've been listening to a biography of Theodore Roosevelt, our 26th president, the early 20th century. And the man was always boxing and fighting, wrestling, like for fun and for fitness and for sport. I don't want to fight or wrestle or box anybody, right? But as a follower of Jesus, regardless of how I might feel about a war with Satan or a war in my mind, regardless of how I might feel about fighting in general, there is no more worthwhile endeavor than acknowledging that the warfare is taking place and fully engaging, fully embracing the fight and the victory that is ours by the power of the Spirit. 1 Timothy 6.12, Paul told Timothy that the fight of faith is a good fight. Let's think about our thoughts in terms of two W words here. Uh, worship 
and ways. Worship is why we think what we think. Ways are how and what we think. Worship is the underlying thoughts, the underlying belief behind and beneath our thoughts. Ways are the content and frequency of our thoughts. Worship is more decision after thoughtful contemplation. Ways are much more spontaneous or reactive and usually just habitual. So you can think of it this way. If thinking were a road trip, worship would be the decision about where to go and why to go there. Ways would be, well, the way you got there, the mode of transportation and so forth. If thinking were brushing our teeth, worship would be the deep philosophical beliefs that you have about dental health and personal hygiene and social interactions, right? But ways would be just the toothbrush that you use, the toothpaste, how many times per day, and so forth. And in attacking our minds, our enemy attacks both of these, our worship and our ways. Again, worship is the foundation of every single thought that we think. It is our being convinced of what is most valuable, what is to be most treasured, what governs, what is in authority, what should have our surrender and our submission and our primary focus. These are worship components. What absorbs the most thought and planning, energy, emotional investment, celebration in our mind? discussions in our minds, priority of our thoughts and our emotional and thought resources. The worship aspect of our thinking is what is worthy of setting our mind upon? Now, the thing about all of that is that we rarely consider these things consciously, especially when it comes to just our everyday thoughts. But this is the deep foundational part of of why and how and what we think, all right? So ways, and the ways are the daily minute-by-minute living and thinking, the actual practice of our mind, the way we think. And there are several components to this. One of these is worldview. And our worldview includes thoughts about what connects what's happening or what we're thinking about right now with anything and everything else and anything that's ever happened in history. Biblical example Paul, Colossians 1.24, says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings. And we should stop right there. Did you hear that? I rejoice in my suffering. And in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. Paul is in prison, suffering, and he's joyful about it. Why? Well, because of his worldview. He's not, he has an expansive, biblical, God-centered worldview. He recognizes that suffering, and especially his suffering there at that time, had an apostolic purpose. It was completing the sufferings of Christ. It was advancing the church. It was advancing the kingdom of God. That was Paul's worldview. It was a much larger and much more biblical worldview than, say, the prosperity gospel, which would have had Paul sitting in prison saying, hey, what in the world? I've been preaching the gospel. Where's my jet plane and my, you know, all my stuff? right? No, Paul had the correct worldview as he suffered, and that's why he was able to have joy even in the midst of suffering. Another part of our ways of thinking is the content, which is the thoughts themselves, the images, the words. This is self-explanatory. There's also emotions and mood. This is a part of our ways of thinking. These are the feelings experienced in and around thoughts, right? You ever had a thought hurt? Um, you ever had a thought uh, make you happy? You know, these are the, these are the surface level, the fi- kind of the final effect of our thoughts. But our thoughts, again, they're just mostly habit. They're just kind of mental toothbrushing. Because if we notice anything at all about our minds and our thoughts and what we're thinking, it's usually just along the lines of the very top category there, our emotions, maybe the top two at most. Remember, Satan has a counter thought. Satan has misplaced worship and misinterpretation for every issue of life. All of them. And his misinterpretation is always contrary to Scripture. Now, there are a lot of these in the back portion of your handout. We'll touch on just three of them now. 
So in the issue of sin and falling short, there's the truth, and then there's this, a satanic misinterpretation. When it comes to sin and falling short, the satanic misinterpretation would be some sort of condemnation or excuses. Any thoughts such as, you did it again. Why would God forgive you yet again? And you haven't talked to God since the last time you did this and asked him to forgive you for this. Condemnation. Could God really save somebody who acts like this? Could someone who acts like this actually be a believer? etc., etc. Those are not truthful thoughts. Those are attacks of the enemy. Another attack of the enemy when it comes to falling short in sin is excuses, right? Well, it's okay because what is the truth about sin? What is the truth about the reality for the Christian when we fall short? Well, it's that we have forgiveness, right? We have forgiveness in Christ for our sin, and we also have power to fight sin. So the satanic misinterpretation is condemnation and excuses. The truth is forgiveness and power. Another issue, Christian responsibility. There's a satanic misinterpretation for this as well. It would be fear-based demands or helpless victimhood versus the truth, which is just joyful, grace-driven victory and service. Christian responsibility, hey, if you don't, if you, don't you know what's going to happen, right? You will suffer the consequences. You better, you better do it. They'll think ill of you. Right? Or helpless victimhood. Uh, I can't do that. I don't want to do that, and I don't think I could anyway. Those are attacks of the enemy. The truth behind our Christian responsibility is joyful, grace-driven, victory, and service. To see the law of God fulfilled, to hear his pardoning voice, turns a slave into a child, and duty and to choice. Accomplishment. Satan has his version of misinterpretation and thoughts in and around any accomplishments that we might experience in our life. Of course, pride would be essential to that. Uh, just box checking or judgment of others who aren't doing as well as we are. Judgment of others who didn't accomplish what we accomplished, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Self-glory. Satan will give you all kinds of tickets for your mind to go down the road of self-glory. Versus the truth, gratitude and humble acknowledgement of God's grace, glory to God. Now, when it comes to our minds and our habits of thinking, brain scientists say that once we've had a thought, it's easier to have that thought again because thoughts can create neural pathways in our minds. And those pathways become stronger and stronger the more we think in those patterns. And especially if we think that way uh, with strong emotions attached to the thoughts. And, they say, new mental pathways can be created by thinking new thoughts and following different patterns and habits of thinking. Imagine that. So Romans 12, 2, and all the other uh, scripture about our minds, they don't need proof, right? But here's the God-created a physiological, biological, neurological reality through which our minds are renewed. New thoughts, new patterns of thinking. Part of the miraculous transformation power of the gospel is the spirit-led, uh, spirit-filled, grace-driven sanctification that happens when we surrender our minds to the spirit and when we think and believe rightly on a repeated and consistent basis. Our mind is renewed. Here's an analogy that's helpful to me, so I'll share it in case it helps a little bit. Um, if I were to think of my mind as a house, um, I could describe my experience this way. All right, so at the age of 10, my mental house that was built on sin and self and a house that was separated from God and uh, destined for condemnation and judgment was saved. And the faulty foundation was, re was removed and a new foundation was put in. I testify that Christ is my firm foundation. He's the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I won't sing. But he is my foundation, and he's never let me down, right? And part of that salvation means then that Jesus himself, the Holy Spirit of God, took up residence in the house of my mind. Jesus' promise in John 14 is true. He sent a comforter. 
the Holy Spirit is so faithful to comfort and to intercede and, and to convict of sin, and most importantly, to open my eyes to the beauty of Christ and the gospel and to convict of sin. So the Holy Spirit took up residence, and he's been there every moment since. He doesn't come and go based on which worship song I'm listening to or based on my behavior. He's always there. The Holy Spirit of God is always present. But because of the experience of life, along with other inputs, reading, listening, watching, and thanks to dozens of thoughts per minute, there are some other things in the house of my mind. There are those huge endless storage rooms that the scientists say contain every single memory and every single experience and every single thought we've ever had. That's what they say. I find it difficult to get into that storage room and locate things, but they say, they say it's there. Right? My current thoughts, though, that's the storage room, but my current thoughts, my current habits of thoughts and thought patterns, we can imagine them as the decor or the fixtures or the furniture in the house of my mind. They're what my mind is set on, again, on a daily basis, kind of on a minute-by-minute, minute, in a minute-by-minute minute habitual way. The foundation of the house is why it exists in its present form, but it's the walls and furniture, that's what's seen. That's what draws attention and focus. And so, for decades, I just wandered around in the wilderness of my thoughts. And the enemy basically had free reign to facilitate and influence misinterpretations and disordered worship and thoughts in and around those things. The Spirit was there, but I did not acknowledge His presence very often, let alone surrender to Him. And so my mind just kind of did its thing, just kind of thinking whatever it thought. And so, of course, my thoughts were very rarely prayers, very rarely expressions of gratitude and praise to God. And this is extremely dangerous because, again, Satan has so many alternative interpretations, so many twisted, bent thoughts and beliefs through which he can wreak havoc and even bring devastation and destruction. That's how he attacks our minds. And most of it's habit, most of it's mental ways, right? I've been brushing my teeth like that for decades. And it's been a long process. It's going to take a lifetime, but the Holy Spirit, one moment at a time, literally one thought at a time, is helping me pry loose and replace the old disorienting, misinterpreting wallpaper to take out the old pictures and the old furniture in the house of my mind. And to the extent that I surrender to him, he's helping me have more, more truthful thoughts, more Bible thoughts, more grace, more holiness, more purity more Jesus, more gospel. So like a compass that recalibrates a GPS, if it gets off course, we constantly reorient, recalibrate our thoughts, especially when we have deep-seated, years-long habits of thinking. So how do we do this then, as we finish up here? How do we resist Satan's attacks and set our minds on the Spirit? Well, we do it by surrender, disciplines of grace, noticing and prompt and you'll see going through the middle there all of these are surrounded by and built upon prayer we surrender number one there surrender every thought to the power control and direction of the holy spirit pray every morning a prayer of surrender to the spirit a prayer of gratitude to him pray it silently right now right lord i surrender my thoughts to you Holy Spirit, guide my thoughts. So we surrender, and then there's the disciplines of grace, which are gathering with the family of God and daily time alone with God. These are foundational to our thought life. They're like the framework that anchors our mental house into the foundation of Christ. Look, don't let Satan misinterpret church, small group, and daily time with God as some kind of optional thing or something that's not as important as kids' sports or whatever else might be on your schedule. These disciplines and practices are essential. But then, what about, what about the rest of our waking moments? 
when our super efficient mind is doing its thing, generating thousands of thoughts and ideas, what do we do then? Because again, for me, I was mostly regular with Bible reading, prayer, church attendance, but my mind was otherwise unsurrendered and unsubmitted. So as we surrender, as we faithfully practice, this, practice the disciplines of grace, it is also very important that we notice our thoughts. And if you're like me, maybe you don't even recognize that you're thinking in ways that are some sort of misrepresentation of the truth, some sort of misrepresentation of God's character. Maybe it doesn't have anything to do with him at all. We must have the Spirit help us recognize and notice the enemy's twisted interpretations for what they are so that we can then replace that thought with a truthful thought. Now, the last way here, the other way for us to address the day-to-day uh, habit level of our thinking is to create prompts, all right? Create prompts that connect and anchor our everyday thought patterns back down into our worship and worldview. And y'all, this is where it can be really exciting. Uh, here's where the victory over the enemy's attack on our minds is possible right here, right now, tonight. Our minds respond to prompts. We have alarm clocks that prompt us to wake up in the morning. We have work hours that prompt us to work the hours that we're supposed to work. And the phone tech industry has mastered prompts, right? They call them notifications. And we react to them like Pavlov's dogs. We feel them when they're not even happening, right? Yep. So Satan, our enemy, he has built all kinds of false prompts into the kingdom of this world. And so we have to resist those. Our response to the enemy's attack on our mind is to actively and intentionally build as many spirit-driven prompts into our day as possible. And this is, might sound very familiar to some of you, but this is how you do it. Post-it notes, scheduled prayer times, anything and everything that will prompt our thinking toward God. And mostly anything that will prompt prayer thoughts. Um, the handout that you have has a lot of suggestions in there and you can use some of those. So our enemy has many resources in this world by which he presents his misinterpretations and exploits the weaknesses of our minds. But we have the ultimate weapon to resist his attacks. Here it is, the ultimate weapon. Romans 8 9, You, however, not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him, but if Christ is in you, Although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give to your mortal bodies through his life, through his spirit who dwells in you. John 14, 17, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Now, growing up, I heard a lot of sermons and the preacher would often say, if you don't remember anything else I've said tonight, remember this. I'm saying that to you right now. Remember this next part, please. We can communicate with God with our thoughts. Now, if you're like me, it's not that, it's not that you don't know this, right? It's just that you don't embrace the full blessing, the full benefit, and the full power of it. The Holy Spirit's presence includes the minds of those who are born of the Spirit. John 3, 6, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. God knows our thoughts. Psalm 139, 1 and 2. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. Even if God's Far away, he knows our thoughts. Psalm nineteen fourteen. let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So we combine the reality of the Spirit's presence in us, meaning we communicate to God with our thoughts, with our saved mind. We combine that with the New Testament imperatives regarding prayer and thanksgiving. First Thessalonians five sixteen. rejoice always, pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Colossians 4.2, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Prayer includes thoughts expressed to God. 
we can pray with our thoughts. Could there be a greater resource at our disposal? We can converse with our Trinitarian God, our Heavenly Father, the lover of our souls, our King and Redeemer, our Savior, the same Spirit who moved over the primordial waters at creation, our Comforter and Helper. We can communicate with our Trinitarian God by thinking. Satan cannot dwell in our minds. He can't read our minds. He can just present his alternative interpretations. It's only God who has taken up actual residence and presence in our minds. What a joy. What comfort. What power in spiritual warfare. Surrender your thoughts to the Spirit who dwells in you. Again, this is a posture and a behavior. It's a condition and it is to be our practice, our status, and our lifestyle. And by that, our mind is renewed, and we are transformed, like Romans 2 promises. It's not glamorous or dramatic, but it is the most powerful and effective way for us to think and to defeat the enemy's attacks on our mind. It is the most powerful use of our mind, communication with God himself. Now, the enemy's going to attack our minds now and every day for the rest of our lives. So we fight by surrender. Surrender to the Spirit who is present in our minds. Now, regardless of computing power or processing speed, the most important reality of our saved minds is that God is there. He is with us, and he is, uh, His omnipresence includes our very minds and thoughts. So the enemy attacks... He certainly doesn't have, as we learned last night, he doesn't have any sympathy for our mind's vulnerabilities and weaknesses. That's exactly where he attacks. That's exactly what he attempts to exploit. That's where he does his work. But the Holy Spirit literally dwells in our minds with his love and power. The thoughts and the thought patterns that we notice so that we can change and point them to Jesus, those are the thought patterns that are ultimately worthwhile. Because knowing him is worth it. And if we have to experience suffering, if we have to experience uh, things that might be used by the enemy to turn our minds in the wrong direction in order to depend upon Christ, so be it. What a blessing, right? Knowing him is worth it. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for our time tonight. Holy Spirit, thank you that uh, you're present in the mind of each and every believer who is here. And Lord, I would not want to assume if there is anyone here who is not a believer, who doesn't know um, what it is to uh, be a child of God. Um, I pray that you would move in their heart tonight, that you would draw them to yourself. Um, thank you that the reality for us as believers is that you are with us. I pray that we would not worry, that we wouldn't just I give in to fear or anxiety or to sin, uh, starting with our thoughts. I pray that our thoughts would be those that are worshipful to you, that they would be thoughts of truth. Uh, we ask that you, you would do this in our hearts and lives by the power of your spirit. It's in your name I pray. Amen.